everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Look, I'm sitting next to Mr. Matthew Weiss. Cheers. How are you? I'm doing great. It is so nice to be hanging with you after this long, long year. Oh my gosh. It's, it's sort of the year that, I don't know, what, what would you call 2020? I don't know. A, a re, retake. It's, yeah. <laughs> put playlist it, let's get another. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, this time stretch it. Or maybe just, yeah. Yeah, it was definitely, it, it's been uh, interesting. For me, it was weird because I went from traveling a lot and being able to do so many wonderful things to not being able to leave the house. Yeah, no, it was, I, I was doing a lot of traveling, recording in Atlanta and Miami, and then boop, stuck in the apartment for 365 days. Did you have the, um, I was starting to read about this because I remember like end of March, beginning of April, I get this email from Reed saying, hey, any mixes you've got done, I'm going to do a deal, you know, anticipating this kind of slowdown. And then I remember maybe end of April, I hit him up and said, oh, I've got a mix. He's like, oh, dude, I'm slow, snowed under. It was like everybody for a few weeks was all super nervous. And then suddenly, wait there, I'm at home. Let's make some music. No, there was an exact mappable trajectory of psychology influencing the engineering side of things. The very first thing that happened, I lost like 75% of my gigs. Yep. That was that was March. I had Boys to Men lined up. I had mixed the first record. I was ready to do the whole album. And then they lost their residency. They lost their touring. And so I lost the because there was no money there. Yep. So I, that was the case. Uh, Khan was going to do a record right out the window. Then... A month and a half later, two months later, just when I had sort of started telling people like, hey, it's COVID, maybe I'm lowering my rates a little, right. then suddenly an onslaught of people being like, so we've decided since the only thing we can do trapped in our houses is make content, we're hiring. So I got really busy over the right. summer. And then it kind of normalized and sort of started finding its ebb and flow. And you know, things have, have got big in January, cooled down a little bit now. So it's- yep. I agree. Yeah, that seemed to be what everybody was saying. Yeah, it was like, oh no, where's the money going to come? Well, how am I going to pay the bills? To like, I'm swamped. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I heard from uh, Fender and a couple of other companies, Yamaha, different guitar manufacturers and stuff, that it was like their biggest years for guitar sales. I well, because you're you've got time to practice. Yeah. 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 Well, so what we're going to do? We're going to do our frequently asked questions Friday fact Friday. But I have not shown you any of these questions. No. So I'm going to have you... I've been infrequently asked. (laughs) So I'm going to ask you first, um, we might have completely different answers to some of these. I hope we do. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. As you know, or those of you that don't know, but many of you do from obviously watching the channel before, Matt is probably, I don't know, I don't want to characterize you. What would you say most of the genre you work in is? I primarily work in the urban umbrella, so urban pop, uh, experimental indie pop, hip hop, reggaeton, EDM. Right. Basically, if if the drum track is usually programmed, I'm probably working in the genre. Wait, right. I'm sorry, that's metal. My mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, cut. No, no, keep it in. So we're gonna do one take here, Eric. <laughs> All right, but yeah. So I, I would think of myself as like urban, urban pop. Okay, good. So we may have completely different perceptions. So we'll see. All right, so the first question, I'm just going to go through this list that Eric has randomly selected these. Um, And remember, if you want any questions answered, leave them down below. Say somebody comes to you with pre-recorded tracks of which some are not all that great. You've been hired to do a mix. How far do you go to fix out-of-time performances and playing and out-of-tune singing? You know, it's funny, I actually talked about this exact topic. My my feeling is, is that it's good to be bold. We have to, you cannot fight your own aesthetic. So if you hear something and you go, that's wrong, even if it feels like you might be stepping outside of your own bounds in terms of what you're creatively adding to a record or taking away from a record, you still do it. Let let the artist tell you that you're wrong. Be Be brave enough to lose the gig. Because you have to be yourself. And if you just fight that, all you're going to be doing is regurgitating roughs and you're going to be in the middle of the pack. You're never going to have a brand identity or anything like that. So I will go to whatever extents I feel necessary. I will change the timing. I will add backup vocals. I have done that on many records. I will replay the bass line. I, whatever needs to be done to make the record as amazing as I think it could be. What he said. Next. 
<laughs> okay. I mean, that that's it. I mean, I, I've done three Ace Freely albums, and Ace will put five guitar parts down on a chorus. But sometimes of those five di- guitar parts, there's not actually a double of the rhythm. So he'll do like a big, rakey, powerful rhythm. And this is like classic rock, so you want to have one on one speaker and one on the other, but he doesn't do it. And so I'll just take the second chorus and copy it over to the first and pan those wide. And then I might mute two of the guitar parts because in my ear, they're conflicting. I'll send him back the mix and he'll go, oh, sounds great. He he wants it to sound better. Yeah. It, It tends to be that artists who are more vetted and secure in their process are generally speaking more open to having things changed as long as it's done tastefully and within the vision that they originally right. had. It's the more insecure artists where they go like, that's not what I hired you for. Yeah. I want to speak to the vocal tuning for a second and have your opinion. Well, before I tell a story, when, what, what is your sort of feeling on specifically because um, this, this person here mentioned out of tune singing? I, well, first I use my judgment because there's, there's out of tune good and there's out of tune bad. Out of tune bad, we fix. Out of tune good, we have to use our judgment because some genres really want to hear things tightly tuned. Some genres don't. I I fight with Khan, Akon, a lot with his tuning because he can actually genuinely sing, but he's kind of like an auto-tune guy. So he likes to hear his stuff super tuned, but I kind of want to move the branding over a little to showcase like his actual voice. There was a record called Ain't No Peace where I deliberately left some of it a little off tune because mm-hmm. the soul of it was there and I didn't want to mess with that. Sure. So I, it's discretion though. With the tuning, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is just an, a, an assumption I'd make. As an artist gets older, I feel like I want it to be a little rawer, a little bit more honest. It's fine when you're... 15 and you're on a Disney show and everything's like Dwee, wee, perfect and all this kind of stat. But as you get older, you want a little bit of like, you want to show there's some yeah. knowledge in there, some wisdom. I want to hear the cracks. That's yeah, yeah. yes. That's exactly yeah. what it was. Is yeah, that I, I want to hear the soul. Sometimes, sometimes you want to see the wrinkles, you know? Yeah. So I think, and one thing I'll say, um, great question, by the way. Um, one thing I'll say, um, is I get asked all the time, how do you tune? And I always say, you listen for things that bother you. And I know that sounds like one of the worst answers because I hate those kind of metaphysical kind of, you know, it's all in the art and creativity. You know, I, I, I don't like being esoteric about this stuff, but that's really what you have to do. You have to develop an ear to only fix because I think people want solutions of like in Melodyne, in Auto-Tune, there's a grid and I could just copy it. Like, no, don't, don't do that unless you're using it as a guide for something that you hear that's wrong to you. The grid is right just frequently enough to mess you up. It's going to be <laughs> right... 90% of the time, yeah. but that's still going to leave that one time where it's going to be off still. Yeah. So I, it can be useful as like a reference, but no, it, remember pitch is the perception of frequency. Mm-hmm. So just because something's on the line doesn't necessarily mean we're hearing it as the correct pitch. Sure. And just because something's off the line doesn't mean we're going to hear it as an incorrect pitch. So it, you have to you have to train your ear. Yeah. Well, this one's going to be interesting because this one's very close to me. But in the world that you live in, this might not make sense. So Perfect. Because neither um, do I. Yeah. <laughs> you and others talk about high-passing the bass to tame the low end. Mm-hmm. But when I use high-pass, there's still tons and tons of bass. Do I need to pass at a higher frequency? Should I layer EQs? Or far more likely, do I just not understand low end yet? Okay, so this is a pervasive myth that spiraled out of control somewhere on the internet, which is that you have to high pass everything Mm -hmm. because it cleans things up and gives you more headroom, which makes no sense based on what headroom is. Stop high passing everything. You definitely don't have to do everything. I mean, especially when you're talking about the kick and the bass, because the kick and the bass, why are you high passing the bass out of the kick and the bass? If you've got sub rumble coming off of an amp that's got a hum or something like that, okay, attenuate that, but have a reason to do it. Like, we're not just doing it because it's somehow magically, well, it's getting rid of the frequencies you can't hear. You can't hear them. Why do you care? Like, (laughs) what, why? See, what I think is interesting, why I want to, why this is a great question for the two of us here is like, what works in rock 
we actually talked about this. It wasn't this question, but we talked a little bit like, so Matt and I did a course together where we mixed a hip hop track. Yeah. And I treated it like a rock song. Yeah. So I took like a hip hop kick drum and made it like a rock kick drum. And I don't just mean like, you know, cutting 350 hertz. And what I mean is like, I changed the relationship between the bass instrument, I can't remember, bass synth and the bass and the kick drum and made it feel more like a rock low end, which was tight, but didn't sound like the intention of the producer. Well, so I think that there's a crossover in that idea where I think that you're going to have a semi-similar answer. But for the stuff that I'm doing, you know, a lot of it is done with synths and program material and samples where it's already very focused sounds. An sure. 808, for example, which is really common in hip hop as the bass, it, it's a sine wave. There's What are we high passing out exactly? Sure. There's nothing to high pass. So correct me if I'm wrong, and if I'm going to paraphrase what we're talking about here. When it comes to programmed instruments, they're quite refined. When it comes to sticking a mic in the general direction of something emitting low end, the room comes into effect, all kinds of craziness comes in effect, how well it's played. Maybe the kick drum, the, the, maybe the, uh, the, the drummer is one of those great people that can make that beat to just tap it and the low ends blooms. And then maybe every th third hit, they keep the beater on it and it goes thud and there's no low end. Yeah. So you can't, there's no one size fits all that. There is no one way of doing it because what works on that, oom, um, doesn't work on that thud. Yeah. So I, I think there's different approaches. I think that is the sort of difference between the rock and, and the non-rock or, you know, kind of thing. Well, I think, though, that the crux of it is, is that, you know, in rock, you're probably finding more reasons to high pass things because there's going to be more things that naturally show up right, there. Right. But you're doing it for a reason. Sure. It's not just like, well, we're high passing it because that's what we do. Well, what if it was tracked in with a high pass filter already on? Right. You know what I mean? So um says so says when I use high pass, there's still tons and tons of bass. Now I wonder. Throw a shelf on there too. Yeah, it's I mean, not one thing I will say, not all plugins are created equally. Uh, there are um there are certain plugins um that I put on and I high pass, and I might use a six, nine, twelve slope, whatever I want to do. And there's still a ton of low end coming through, but I might flick to a different manufacturer's plugin and do exactly the same thing, and half as much low end comes through. Yeah. So don't just because a, a plugin shows you a graphic that looks like this, doesn't mean diddly darn squat. Because yeah, it might be you know, six nine twelve or whatever. I, I I get completely different results. What I tend to do is I like to shape. First, so what I might do is on a bass guitar is I might actually go as high as like 50 or 60, which sounds crazy because that's where a lot of defined low end is. But I'll do that before I boost. Because what happens then is I can get a more controlled boost because I don't have this floppy 20, 40 hertz excessive amounts. So that might sound really nutty to people. But I feel like um, I learned that from Tim Palmer, who's much smarter and much more successful than I am. And that's one of his tricks is like before you go into an EQ, sort of like make sure you're not just kind of like bringing up a lot of extraneous crap that you don't want, shape it going in. But for you, I mean, I mean, you're probably also facing times where the bass is lower than the kick drum. Very frequently. It's, it's, it's an odd relationship, but a lot of the times I find that I will be raising the kick and focus, not necessarily boosting it, but like focusing the kick in that 100 to 120 to even at 150 hertz area, wow. which is high for a kick. High for a rock kick, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the bass is in the 60 to 80, some like goes, you know, I find myself working in like the 40 hertz range sometimes. That's a complete so, flip. Yes, it's exactly To me, the it's like 80 to 100 to 120 is, is low end on a bass guitar. Yeah. Obviously including some 60 as well. But yeah, that's like a... No, it's the opposite. That's that's exactly one of the fundamental difference. But I think that the the bottom line is though that it's a lot of it is balancing. So if the question is, I still find myself getting a lot of low end, mm -hmm. maybe it's just a simple matter of just pulling the level down a little bit. I'd... To expand on this question, how often do you find you're doing um, your side chaining, either volume or frequency, out? Are you doing that often or not? It's funny. I just did a video where I was, I the video was I do everything in the low end wrong, where all of the internet advice that we hear that we're supposed to do to make a low end thing work right, 
I, I'm doing exactly the opposite. So I have the 808 sidechain to the kick. Normally, we think that we would be ducking it, except for I'm doing it with expansion. I'm doing it with upward expansion. So every time the kick hits, the 808 is getting raised. So I do sidechain things, but it's not like I'm just doing it because that's what we do. Sometimes it is. Sometimes, you know, it's if you have like a like a bass guitar that's that's playing a lot, it's very active or it's holding sustained notes, then okay, we we sidechain, we get a little bit of the attack of the kick to cut through. But we have to understand why we're doing it. So if the 808 is really sustaining and I'm missing the punch, the excursion from the 808, and it's supposed to hit with the kick, well, I can get that excursion by chaining it right to the kick and getting expansion. Right, right. No, I love that. Yeah, I, I'm i always a little wary of getting too carried away with multibands and dynamic EQs because yeah. I feel like the music that we all sort of hold up as being like, oh, didn't have the access to this kind of tools that we have now. You know what it is, though? It's because when people see that, they go, oh, wow, it's this this multiband compression that really just brought it all together. So they say that's the magic. And so they think mm -hmm. that's where it is. But in reality, what happened is you got everything right with the traditional EQ levels, compression, the basic stuff, and you spent the time doing that. And then the very last thing, that very last touch, a little multiband compression just to hold the sustain of the low end, but keep the, the, the pluck of the bass guitar punchier. Just to bring it that You're one inch speaking better. my language. You we know what we I mean? talk about this all the time. There's this sort of misconception of this top-down mixing where you mix into it. And I've, I've, I was interviewing Billy Decker the other day, who's obviously a template mixer and talks about it. It's like, no, it's all it, what's going on before the, the, the yes, all of these great mixers have plugins on the multi bus on their on their master bus, on their mix bus. However, all of the clever stuff is going on, and that's just there just to tame maybe an errant frequency or two. It's not there to be mixed into. And I, I it gets so confusing because I, I would say I get, you know, I'm not exaggerate, five emails a day about multi I mean about multiband compressors on a master bus and top-down mixing and some internet guru told you that you, you you should put ozone and 15 things on there and mix into it. I don't believe I've ever on my own mix, maybe once in a blue moon, I'll put a multi-band compressor on my mix bus, but almost never, very rarely. Right, but then I do know guys that do, Billy Decker does, but he uses ozone at the very, very end. Yeah. And he uses it just for like light tapping. No, I mean, there are techniques that you can do for sure, and and people who do make it work, but it's not the secret sauce. It's, it's the secret sauce maybe for them, but the secret sauce for me is not doing that. Yeah. Yep. So it's the magic is way before that one dB change that we've made on the mix bus, you know, at one point seven eight kilohertz, two dB or whatever it is. You know. Yep. This one's I think is gonna is, is nicely splits our two worlds here. So it says no matter, and it's another low end thing. No matter what I do, my bass either sounds too muddy or boomy, or just simply gets lost in the mix. In rock production with heavy distorted guitars, it isn't that terrible. But with pop tracks, it really becomes a problem. I just can't get a powerful bass without it sounding like it's the lead element. And I'm talking about 808 sub basses and sometimes even bass guitar. Interesting that it's both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because my immediate thought was that this is coming from a rock perspective. And mm -hmm. I was going to say, well, it's probably in your picking technique or your your uh, hooking technique. Because when you have a flubby bass, usually it's on a bass guitar, it's from the playing technique. Sure. But when you start talking about 808s, I find the number one thing that makes an 808 out of control in a pop track is when people are not managing the release of their generator. And what that means is that an 808 follows an envelope shaper. So you have your attack, and then you have your decay release. And if that release is too long, then it overruns the next 808 hmm. hit. And when you have two bases coming together, even if they're the same note, because they're not in time together, they start to interact in a really weird way that that does not translate nicely. So generally, it's right at the production phase. The 808 is too long for mm. the tempo of the record. So I would start by looking there. Now, if if you run out of problems or you run out of solutions on that front, 
then what I was doing with the side chaining of the kick to the 808 was exactly to help open up the low end. It was so that I could get that hit from the 808 that wasn't there because the 808 was too sustainy. And then I could turn the 808 down a little bit to let the low end breathe. So it wasn't even really an EQ thing, which is, I think, where people tend to go. Right. Yeah, I, f- I forget about that because um, I don't think about 808s in those terms. I mean, I have 808 samples. So I'll just put an 808 sample in. But you're right. The sustain of that, I mean, I mixed, uh, uh, we recorded and mixed a uh, live rock band, Black Veil Brides, and they had sections in the songs that were like on the, on the kick. It was just insane. Yeah. And all, all, what I did in that was I literally EQ'd the kick drum completely differently um, because the low end was just, just blah, 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 blah. And then I was like, what am I doing? And I just went in there and I just gated the kicks. Yeah. So instead of going boom, 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 they went do, 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 and they were all stunted, but they had the click, they had the low end, and suddenly you felt thump, 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 rather than just this wobbly mess, which I think is what they're talking about here. So yeah, I think that might be the secret, is to get in there and shorten the sustain on your sub information, particularly the kick or the 808 in this instance. Yeah. But he says, um, or they say, sorry, 808 sub basses. I, I mean, those sometimes get interchanged. A lot of the times I'll get tracks in from people and it'll say 808 and it's clearly not an 808. Like it's very obviously like a Moog bass or something unrelated, but right, it's just, right. it's become a catch-all for sub bass. I was asking uh, Matt if he would do like a, Low end mixing 808 video for us yeah. off camera. Yeah, and on camera, I say the same thing. Yeah, of course. Yes! <laughs> Be happy to. No, that's fantastic. As a kid, fresh out of college, how do I get started? Where do I start? With so many other students finishing college, how do I stand out from the others? You know, while we were hanging out, you told me a really cool story. Maybe the abridged version of that would be uh, appropriate for getting that foot in the door. Oh, Tommy Vacari? Yeah. Yeah. It, there's there's a great Tommy Vacari video that we did. Um, and I think I've told it before, maybe just in the Academy, but essentially Tommy in the 60s when Capitol Records was like the holy grail, the Beatles were signed there, Frank Sinatra, the Beach Boys, everybody wanted to work in the studio. So he went to the studios in the late 60s and said, here's my resume, I want to get a job. And they were like, good luck, son. We've got 100 people a day applying for one job that we get every six months. So he thought to himself, well, why don't I just see if I can get a job in the building? So he got a job in the record company, which, of course, is all the upstairs. And, of course, the only job he could get was in the mailroom. So he was like one of those guys that went with the, you know, with the, with the trolley and handed out, you know, all the mail. But because it was owned by the same company, he did go and deliver mail in the studio. And I think I'd have to go back and watch the video, the Tommy Vaccari one, but I think it was like a two-year process of him befriending people in the studio. So eventually, he they allowed him to come in and sit in sessions. And he sat in sessions, you know, at five when he clocked off till early hours of the morning. And this happened, I don't remember how long he said, but we'll pretend it was a year or two. It was a considerable amount of time, not a week. And one day, the engineer was sick and didn't show up. And they're like, he'd been helping unofficially. And they were like, can you run the session? And he ran the session. And that was his quote unquote big break. That was his lucky moment. I mean, there's no luck in it. He spent a couple of years building relationships, working for free through the night, barely sleeping, just to get his face in there. What's the expression? Is they say uh, uh, fortune is when opportunity meets preparation? Something like that. Something that sounds like, good. Like, I'll go with that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what I always say is, fortune is when opportunity makes preparation. You, you don't. There isn't one way to get started. So you just do as much as you can, and and something will stick because there's no shortage of opportunity. Yeah. You just have to be constantly there doing whatever you can do to get in the room, whether it's working at the adjacent coffee shop or the the mail room or just showing up for no reason at all. Yeah. You yep. know, you just get in the room. Yeah, and the other thing is, I think it's important to remember is like. That wasn't like a, that wasn't the Beatles. That wasn't the Beach Boys. It was probably a, um, because he didn't remember anything who it was or or wasn't important. It was just they needed somebody to cover the job. He didn't suddenly like engineer a number one record, you know, in his first night. 
It was just, oh, he could prove he did something. It was So it was even like the first rung of the first rung of the first rung. So now they've got this guy who can maybe cover a couple of shifts. You know, it was the beginning, but it's a really important part. I mean, the other one that um, um, when I was on Pensado, I, I told him this. He loves the story was Jack, Jack Douglas and his um, his like best friend at the time. They wanted to meet the Beatles. And I think it was in 1965. And they got on a steamer. And merchant steamers, they stowed away and they took food with them. <laughs> And water and stowed away to Liverpool from New York. That's amazing. And they had a, they had their guitars with them. Wow. And they stowed away. And of course they're like they're at sea for like a week. And of course they run out of food and water. So they have to come out and go, hey, we've stowed away. So when they arrived in Liverpool, the 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 seamen were like, you're not getting off the ship. You don't have any papers. You know, this is pre, you know, the kind of e easier travel. You know, and they're like, you're stuck on it. But one of the seamen went down to a local pub at night and got a little drunk and started telling stories of these two crazy kids that had stowed away to come and meet the Beatles in Liverpool. Wow. And it just so happened somebody in the bar was a journalist from a lo the local paper. So the next day, he comes down to the ship, takes a photo of the kids, and it's on the front page. I think it's the Liverpool Echo. You can find it online. There's Jack and his friends standing there with the guitars, like, you know, at, at the port, and... Eventually, you know, for a little bit of public outcry, like a day or two later, they uh, they they take them to the Cavern Club, and they obviously the Beatles weren't even there. The Beatles were in London, so they take them to the Cavern Club, and you know they watch the local bands playing or whatever. Maybe I don't know what it was, you know, but had a bit of time in the town, stuck them back on the boat, and off they go back home. All right, why am I telling you this story? First of all, it's a lot of effort that they put in. Yeah. All right, a lot of effort. Okay, now flash forward like early 70s, Jack has played with Chuck Berry playing bass, one of the pickup bands. He'd written the campaign song for Robert Kennedy. He had done like a million things. He'd worked his ass off, but all he wanted to do was work in a studio. So he gets a job in the record plant as like the lowest possible thing. He's a janitor in the record plant. Eventually, he does some tape transfers. They just like, so he sits in a little, little like cubby hole and transfers tapes. You know, so one day there's a knock on the door. He says, come in, opens the door. John Lennon is standing there. And John Lennon says, I have a tape from my reel to reel at home and I'd like it transferred to, I presume cassette, I don't know, but you know, transferred for me. And Jack's like, like, okay. So John Lennon says, oh, do you mind if I wait for it? He's like, okay. And so Jack, John Lennon just like sits down next to him. And Jack's like doing the tape transfer. And he said it was like, he was like awkward for about five or 10 minutes. He's transferring the demo over or whatever. And eventually he sheepishly says to John Lennon, you know, I've been to Liverpool. It's like five years later, six years later. And John's like, John Lennon's like, oh, you've been to Liverpool? Um, when, when, when did you go to Liverpool? And he goes, well, me and my friend stowed away on this merchant ship back in 65, and, and he's like literally the words coming out of his mouth, and John Lennon starts cracking up. Like it's the funniest thing he's ever heard. It must have been. And, and he goes, wait, are you one of those crazy yanks that got on the boat and came over? We were in London and we used to get the Liverpool Echo or whatever the paper was, and, and we saw him. We were all like joking about these two idiot kids. Like He's like, you know what? You should come and assist us on this record. It'd be great to have you in there. That was his big break. I mean, that is a lot of freaking work Yeah. to get to a situation, you know? And maybe, wow. maybe there was some luck in that, but no, I mean, there's nothing lucky about that. That doesn't sound like a good time. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of effort. Yeah, that's like five or six years of being too. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, and that was his big break. That's one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, he told me that when we were working on an Aerosmith record. It was such a cool story. I hope I'm allowed to tell it, Jack. I think you've told it before. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was definitely like a like an old grandpa tale coming out there, but oh my gosh, what an intense story. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, so yeah. <laughs> so what's your, so <laughs> let's let's finish up with this one because I, you, you you asked me to answer it first, but what what is your, what, so let's get really specific. Kid comes out of college. I don't know. Kid's probably not fair, but you know, 19, 20, 21 years old, 22 years old, you're coming out of college. 
where do you start? What What is the advice now for somebody who's early 20s, coming out of college, maybe they've got a degree in engineering or, or whatever it might be, some kind of music business thing? So I, I would say you want to you want to see 10 people answer this question because I think everyone's going to have a different answer or a different perspective. Mm-hmm. There isn't one way to start. All I can do is basically say what I did. What did you do? What I did was everything I possibly could. I was going on Craigslist looking for internships. I ended up getting I I ended up getting two internships. One I found on Craigslist and one I bumped into somebody at an AES or something like that. I was lost and and she was lost too. Uh, her name is Denise Barbarita and both lost together. We found our way. We hit it off and I started interning for her. Nice. And now that was both in New York while I was living in Philadelphia. So in order to intern, I was taking the Chinatown bus up twice a week so that I could go intern because that's where my internship was. And that's a that's small amount of effort. Pers- by well, Where did you stay? Uh, I would stay on couches with friends or I had a girlfriend in New York when I first left school. So I stayed at her place uh, until we ended up breaking up and then... I would stay because you got to spend so much quality time with her, working eighteen hours a day in the studio, and, and not living in New York. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I, I remember the first time that Mark, who was the guy that I met it on Craigslist, I remember the first time he actually paid me was three back to back seventeen hour sessions. He gave me three hundred dollars, which I thought was great. It was more than what I was expecting. I should put that in there. And I, when I was on the Chinatown bus, I fell asleep, and I got pickpocketed. So the first time I got paid for my work, it was stolen. And and when I realized that, I realized this is, this, I'm doing everything right. Right, right. That was, that let me know. Because I could either be the person getting pickpocketed or I could be the person doing the pickpocketing. Right, I understand. Yeah. No, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, Eric, come around here, Eric. So, Eric, <laughs> you went to how many different schools and stuff did you go uh, to? Two different schools. You're Sorry, man. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, uh, well, like over here. Like. <laughs> you're, I was going to say, you're out of college. Let me. Uh, <laughs> Where did yeah. you go to school? Um, Recording Connection. And I did a little program there with them. And then I went to a community college because they had a recording program as well. So I did that for. I you didn't do MI as well? I was going to, but I couldn't afford it. So that's why I went oh. to community college. So you went to community college and you and you did the recording connection. Yes. Now, you, how many people did you apply for internships with? Um, I sent an email out to, I Googled uh, Los Angeles producers and every single name and email I can find, I just sent an email to them. How many conservatively? About maybe 20, I would say at least 20. That, that's how many people so responded to you? Uh, just one. <laughs> and who was that? It was you, which... The, the most successful of all the people that I emailed. Um, I didn't think I would ever get a chance, but I just like, what the hell? I, worst thing that can happen is I don't get a reply. And sure enough, I got the reply from you and didn't get a reply from any of the people that were like in their basements. <laughs> so that's, so there's lots of things there. Like, um, you know, this kind of illusion that just because you're a kid out of college and you don't know anything that you have to, just just freaking aim just aim you know what i mean just just find some people write to them you know it, it, you just don't know where your opportunity is going to come from i know for me um i felt less than for years for years and now i, I now i'm just bemused at the kind of opportunism i see in our industry people like just coming up just like talking as though they've they've already sold 100 million records, you know. <laughs> and I was, like, so, like, shy. And now I realize, what am I doing? I don't, I don't have to be such an opportunist that I've got some big ego, but I need to have enough belief in myself. So I think that's the thing I would say is just believe in yourself. Don't be cocky. You know, don't, don't feel like you know it all, but be confident enough to just reach out to people. Because, like, Eric reaches out to 20 19 bedroom producers and me, and I'm the only one that responded. Well, it makes sense, though, because you're the only person who actually has the real need for somebody to be there. You know, it it makes sense that the people who who don't really have something going on can't really respond. Right. 
I'm just impressed that that he got one out of twenty because a lot of times you have to do a hundred before you right. even get a bite. So right, yeah, y- you got lucky, son. You got lucky, son. <laughs> yeah, but I have heard other times where people have applied for fifty, you know, studios, well-known people, not so well-known, and they just don't get responses. And yeah. I, I understand. I mean, I get a lot of emails like that, and I try, and you know, and if you're one of the people that's email me, I try my hardest and darndest to respond to everybody. I try my hardest to respond to everybody that comments. It's just because it's really all about community, what we do. It's all about creating community and helping each other. Um, But yeah, I mean, I have had four uh, interns that became assistants that have won Grammys. Nice. I have, I had, let's see. I have had one assistant who went on to actually found a music school and that's still running very successfully. And I have one assistant who is freelancing and working in the business has not won any Grammys yet, but now is, is their own person. I think I've only had maybe five assistants over my career though. So, right. Yeah. I've had, I've had a lot. I mean, I've had a lot of, of guys and girls come through and work with me and I don't, when I say that I've had them win Grammys, I, it's not based on, oh, because they work with me. No, it's based on the fact that they stuck it out. No, no, it's it's definitely, yeah. it's They stuck it out. They worked. They went through the ringer. I mean, Phil started interning with me at 18 years old, and his first day on the job, he had to get up um, and be at a place to pick up a PA at 6 a.m. in the morning and finished work at 2 a.m. because we set up an outdoor festival. That was Phil Allen's first day of work with me. So he worked, what's that math? Four hours off it. It's a 20-hour day, unpaid, and then worked the full weekend for the festival that we were putting on. And he won a Grammy for Adele, someone like you. It was the engineer on it. At my other studio. Pretty cool when you get, like, Grammy for... It was the it was the Grammy for Song of the Year and, of course, Record of the Year. No, oh, that's... It's not a bad award. Any, anything, any, even an Adele credit... Yeah. Is is I would love to have an Adele credit. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah. 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 So, anyway, look, wonderful question, and please, in this spirit, give us a whole bunch of great questions, and uh, let's get let's get you back and do more of these. Yeah, man, this was fun. Yeah, this is fun for me. Just <laughs> take some of the pressure off. <laughs> a, little, a little impromptu cameo. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Warren. Thanks, everyone, for the wonderful questions. Please leave any comments and questions below for future Frequently Asked Questions and have a marvelous time recording, mixing, mastering, writing, I don't know, playing mandolin, Peruvian sphincter flute. So long, farewell, au revoir, tschüss, dos vidania, uh, goodbye. <laughs>